Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the All Me Podcast. This is Don Hooten Jr., and today I'll be your host. Today, we're back with our sixth and final interview with our partners at the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, or you'll hear us refer to them as PBS CCS. This has been such a wonderful and informative series as we've had the opportunity to interview the best strength coaches and performance coaches in Major League Baseball. We hope you've learned a lot from these guys and that it'll help you or someone in your care be better than they were before. In our final episode, we're going to be talking with Joey Greeny, Major League Strength Coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. The topic that we're going to cover today is speed training. I wish this information is something that I had 30 years ago, as the Lord never gifted me with speed. But as you'll learn, all of us are able to develop this skill and become faster if we're willing to put in the work. Joey is going to provide us with a lot of information that you've never heard about on this topic, and it's something he knows a lot about. A big thanks again to the PBS CCS for all of their years of support on our All Me League and for providing strength and conditioning coaches for this unique series here on the All Me podcast. We also want to take another moment and thank our partners at Gatorade for sponsoring this episode. Let's bring on Joey Greeny and talk about speed training. All right, Joey, thank you so much for joining me today on the All Me podcast. Don, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to talking with you because a while back we had decided to put together this really cool series on, okay, we've talked about nutrition, we've talked about supplements, we've talked about performance enhancing drugs and anabolic steroids, but how do we do things the right way, right? How do we physically train the right way? And through our awesome partnership with uh, PBS CCS, we've put together this six-part series where we've broken down various topics as it relates to strength and conditioning. So what we're doing to kind of start each one is we just want to learn more about who you are and your background. So why don't we talk about some of the early days of Joey and where are you from and what were your interests early on and really what led you to your passion for strength and conditioning? Yeah, Don. So, you know, great question. I mean, everybody's journey's uh, very different. You know, you can probably ask 10, 10 coaches that you have on this podcast and each one will have a different story. I grew up in, uh, in upstate New York, Hudson Valley. You know, I participated in pretty much all sports growing up. I was very athletic. Um, I really focused on baseball and the martial arts, uh, which I was very good at. I uh, competed in both of them at very high levels uh, at the Junior Olympic Games in, with Taekwondo and the World Championships and then uh, in baseball, you know, through high school and through college and some of the collegiate leagues. So I competed there. You know, I went to school, studied exercise science, uh, exercise physiology. I was truly passionate about the body and sports performance. You know, growing up, I was the youngest of four kids, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, you maybe that's when speed really was a passion of mine. You know, I was either running away from them or chasing them <laughs> to keep up. Uh, so, but, uh, but yeah, speed, you know, explosion, that's, uh, really one of my, um, you know, my passions in, in the sports performance field. Um, you know, because, because it's, you know, it's truly a, a game changer. You can really set yourself up. You can really help the team. If you can score from first base in baseball, or you can steal a bag and get into position, you can really help your team win a ball game. Um, you know, the same thing goes for soccer and basketball and hockey on a fast breakaway. You know, those fast athletes are really, really game changing athletes. And, you know, so, you know, this day, you know, I, uh, you know, I worked at velocity sports performance for a little while. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I got out of college, uh, and then I um, I took a job with the Kansas City Royals in 2008. Okay. I worked, uh, and I spent nine seasons there working with uh, various levels of their minor league system. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2017, I came over to the Tampa Bay Rays uh, to the major league staff. Been with them ever since. And uh, along That's the way, terrible. I've met some really incredible people, <clears throat> coaches, staff, yeah. players who uh, even to this day I still keep in contact with. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've been an athlete from, from a young age and it's really cool to hear you talk about martial arts because two of the guys that we've had on our podcast, Nate Shaw from the Arizona Diamondbacks, as you know, uh, mm-hmm. is into martial arts as well as Jose Vasquez from the Texas Rangers. We've had both those guys on. In fact, Jose was telling me as a strength coach in the big leagues, that's how he went and got his black belt. And, you know, he talked about that being one of the biggest accomplishments in his life. I, and I know, you know, that that's not easy to do. So it's kind of cool how all you guys have sort of, you know, just different pathways to get to where you are and, and how you obviously continue to keep yourselves in shape. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you learn so much with martial arts, with balance and breathing and coordination and building rhythm. And those are kind of the early foundations of athletic development. So which are extremely important for any, any young athletes uh, looking to improve their speed and, and, and explosive power. So for somebody, let, let's talk a young person right now for a minute, somebody that's looking to get into the field that you're in. I know it takes, as you've already uh, have explained, it takes years to get into the position that you're in and a lot of hard work and a lot of hours. But if you're a high school student listening to this and, you know, maybe you're a good athlete, but you're probably never going to make it to the big league level. What career path could they take if they wanted to one day become, uh, you know, the performance coach or the head strength conditioning coach for a major league team or an NFL team? Great question. I mean, yeah, if you're a young high school athlete um, looking to get into the field and to do this for a career, you know, first I would take a step back and really ask yourself, is this something that you're truly Mm -hmm. passionate about? Um, because you're going to spend you know, long hours. It's going to be, you know, it's not, you know, all rain rainbows and glitter. You know, there is, there is a grind to the, to the process. So really step back, ask yourself if if this is something truly you're passionate about. And then if so, uh, go ahead and get the, uh, knowledge and the education uh, behind the human body and how to, uh, improve performance. Um, and then from there, get your certifications, everything necessary from a knowledge, from a basic knowledge, uh, standpoint, and then really focus on some of the soft skills like uh, building relationships, developing trust, communication. Mm-hmm. Um, those are really is those those skills are going to separate you from the from the rest of the competition out there, and those are the difference makers that are going to help you to get your athletes to do the things necessary to improve performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's one thing to have a lot of knowledge, but it's another thing to have that knowledge and to also get your athletes to do the things necessary to improve performance. So, and, and, and just take your time with it. You know, some, it takes people longer, it takes people, you know, takes some people a lot quicker, uh, but really enjoy the process and, and, and take your time and just, you know, do a good job of uh, whatever level you're at. You know, I think you talked about kind of the, the glamour part of the job. And I know you get to sit in the dugout during the game. You're working around uh, professional athletes all the time. Uh, but it is a lot of hard work. It is a grind. It is many hours. If you could, sort of in a nutshell, what does your typical day look like? Now, I know right now you're calling in from New York. You have a long road trip. But what would like a typical day be like for you? I mean, are you showing up to the stadium at 5 o'clock for a 7 o'clock game? Uh, or are you, you there all day with the players? Tell us what uh, what a typical day looks like for Joey. Yeah. So, you know, from, from people on the outside looking in, it might seem like, you know, players and staff and coaches show up two hours, an hour before the game, and they just kind of get ready and go out and, and perform. But that's, that's really not the case. And, uh, and so for, for an example, if it, you know, if we're at home and it's a seven o'clock or six o'clock game, we're usually getting to the ballpark around one o'clock in the afternoon. Players are probably coming in about two o'clock. When the players and uh, for on our on my my side of things, uh, you know, it's about getting the weight room prepared. It's about scheduling, uh, conditioning, and scheduling uh, individual workouts for players. Communicating with our uh, medical staff, our uh, biomechanics uh, staff, um, and, the, and the rest of sports science, and collaborating with them to put our players in the best possible position to to succeed that day and to win that ball game that night. So from there, you're developing the schedule. Players will start coming into the weight room. Um, you know, it's always important as a coach to be um, to be consistent in your routine and also be consistent with your with your energy that you're providing in, in the weight room with these players when they're coming in because the players are being exposed to 
so many things on the field, so much stress. So they're kind of up and down, up and down. And you want to be that solid foundation for them. So when they walk into the weight room, they know what to expect from you mm-hmm. from a coaching standpoint. And then from there, we work with our players. We run them through some, uh, some warm up, some prep work. Um, some players could possibly be doing some strength training work on that day. Some players would be doing more speed and explosion work. Uh, some players maybe are doing more corrective um, type of work on that day. Some players are conditioning on that day. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, there's a team of us um, that uh, work with uh, the 26 guys on our roster. Um, from there, we'll go out and we'll do uh, pitchers, pitcher stretch at home. We run them through some, some basic mobility, flexibility exercises. They play catch. They'll condition on the field if they haven't done so already. Then they'll go into batting practice. Um, guys will be taking ground balls, hitting, running. Um, and then from there, they'll come inside. They'll have a meal. They'll get themselves uh, prepared for the game mm-hmm. um, and go out and play the game. Um, so what most people don't realize is that these players are there hours, yeah. uh, what, you know, well, well before the game starts. And they're in the weight room um, getting themselves stronger, become, become more explosive. They're in the training room getting treatment on any – uh, injuries that they may have. Uh, they're working with our uh, sports science staff. We're jumping on force plates and we're uh, doing things like that. Guys are in the video room watching video on maybe the pitcher they're facing that night or uh, maybe they're, they're watching themselves steal bases or uh, different swing and they're in the batting cage. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're speaking to our nutritionist. So there's a lot of things going on and uh, strength and condition is only one piece of the pie that's you know, it's about a typical day. That these yeah, guys and that does yeah. certainly put things into perspective, especially for those those young people, you know, that are out there thinking, hey, I'm, I want to get into professional sports. I want to do what Joey does. And, you know, I'll get there, uh, you know, at five o'clock, like we said, for like a seven o'clock game to get the guys warmed up. And it's definitely not that it, it's a long day. Um, in fact, as you know, we we do the play campaign throughout the year. So when we when we have those those events in the morning time, I mean, you're there at eight or nine in the morning, uh, you know, and then players aren't showing up till one or two. So it's certainly a long day, but throughout this podcast series, we've heard so many different topics on uh, how to improve yourself physically. And one of the topics we wanted to cover and felt it was important to cover was sp- uh, speed training and your name came up first. And I'm so glad we were able to connect and you have the time to do this. So I want to start to see if you could define speed training and you know, again, let's talk about why this is something you're passionate about. Uh, and, and I know you've mentioned some examples, but how does speed training benefit somebody, whether you're an athlete or even maybe a non-athlete? Great question. Speed has always been a passion of mine. It, it's it's truly a game changer. So whether you're scoring from first base, stealing a base, you know, you're a breakaway in soccer and in football, you know, you can really... Uh, you know, put your team in the best possible position to win. You have that little extra step um, or explosive power. So it's, you know, it gets, it gets difficult to train during the season, off season months. You can really focus, uh, you know, most days of the week on developing speed and improving speed in season. It, it tends to get a little difficult, but, you know, at the major league level, we have a lot of technology now that kind of, that kind of helps us and and, and, it, and we're able to balance when we can train athletes with their workload uh, situation with the amount of games they're playing on the field, the amount of practice, you know, coming from our side, it's, you know, there's, you know, there's, you have to, you have to find that sweet spot and that right balance during the season. You don't want to push them too much so where they can't play the game, but you also want to um, expose them to the certain amount of stress in order to improve, you know, in this case, uh, you know, the speed or the explosion. But it's it's always been a passion of mine. Speed is is a, is a uh, game changer. So growing up, I played a ton of sports, and I realized every human being comes in different shapes and sizes. And speed was always one of those things that I felt was was a gift, and it was a gift that I, I didn't ever receive. I was never known to be super fast. But can everybody get better at this skill, or are those of us that are wired like a turtle just doomed when it comes to speed? Uh, years ago, that was the belief. The belief was, you know, you have to choose the right parent, so to speak, in order to have speed. But we found over time and study after study has shown that no matter who you are, no matter young athlete, uh, old athlete, uh, you, you know, you're slow by nature, you're more slow twitch 
fiber, so Mm -hmm. to speak, you can improve speed. So no matter where you are in your athletic journey, you can improve your speed and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication at, you know, at training and, uh, you know, focusing on the right drills, the right exercises, uh, performing them with perfect form over time, you Mm -hmm. can get better and you can, uh, become a little faster, a little quicker. So it is, I was, I was not always the fastest on my teams and, uh, you know, I worked at it and I got myself stronger and, and, and faster. And, uh, but yes, I've worked with many athletes who are very slow, um, at all levels. Uh, they worked at it and, and they got faster. And a lot of time, a lot of things we see, we, a lot of times with young athletes, we see them, they haven't really physically developed into their body. And when they hit those teenage years, they naturally get faster as it, as they mm-hmm. develop um, and and grow. So that's one thing to keep in mind also when you're, uh, if, you know, if you're a parent or a coach and you work with young athletes, you know, sometimes you have to let their body just naturally develop um, and they, they will get faster. Yeah. Mine, mine never did develop. I mean, I could throw the ball pretty hard, so I guess they just kept me on the mound. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about stealing bases, but So what sort of workouts can somebody do if they want to focus on getting faster? So I guess let's start with, let's just take your middle school, high school athlete. They might not have access to some of the facilities or technology that your players do. Uh, What advice could you give them? You know, what are some of the things they can do to help improve their speed? Yeah. So before starting out, you kind of want to take a step back and look at what have they done? You know, what, what have your athletes have done in the past to do this? Uh, from there, I, you know, I know most teams, uh, you know, most people listening to this podcast probably do not have access to uh, the technology that we have with force mm-hmm. plates and velocity-based training and laser times, but a simple stopwatch would do. So first, you would want to do a baseline test, you know, have your athletes come out, a basic stopwatch would do. You set up whatever you want to do, 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards. You test them. You get a baseline measurement um, and then perform B drills, your sprint work, and then retest them again to see where they're at. They're getting they're getting faster. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, if not, then you can always take a step back and adjust your programming. But young athletes, they want to begin with their marching, their skipping, all those uh, running drills that will help to develop rhythm coordination. And those are the foundations of speed development. Uh, From there, the athletes can start performing build-up sprints. This is kind of building their work capacity up, get them used to the volume of sprinting and running. And then from there, focusing on uh, resisted sprinting. So either with a sled, uh, running uphill, parachute, something along those lines where they're running with some resistance and then from there, you want to uh, go into more high-speed sprinting, max-speed sprints, where you you build up for 20 or 30 yards, and then you sprint for 20 or 30 yards. Okay. Um, and you can do all this together simultaneously. Um, definitely the rhythm, the coordination, the skipping, the marching, that has to be built into your warm-up, especially with the younger athletes. Um, and then you can even do... Uh, some of the acceleration drills where you do face down starts and half kneeling starts right in their warm up. So, um, and, and that can be done every day. And you just do a little bit each day and you'll, you should see some improvements. So, you've shared your knowledge all over, all over the internet. I've, I've had an opportunity to, to look at some of those articles, especially on baseball strength. And I even saw a recent post you did uh, on your Instagram channel where you had somebody running with a parachute, uh, which it's, it's really cool to watch. So what I'll be able to do in our show notes, Joey, is I could take some of those articles and, and videos and, and especially on your Instagram page, link that back so people can see some of these examples that you're talking about. But one of the questions I wanted to ask you that, I, you know, more personally, I was curious about is, do you find, you know, people who can squat the most amount of weight to be your faster guys? Like, is there anything to do between, you know, uh, a lot of lower body strength versus speed. Yeah. So I I like to say, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships and strength training is that tide. So it is very, very important that in addition to your sprint work into your explosive work, you are performing 
structured strength training, uh, not only to strengthen your muscles, but your tendons, your ligaments, and your bone. And I do find that the stronger athletes that I've worked with over the years are the, f- the faster athletes, the most explosive athletes. Um, and we like to use objective data. And I find that, you know, we do the jumps on the, on the jump mat, or we do jumps mm-hmm. on the, um, force plates. And those guys that are typically the strongest produce more power and are our highest jumpers, okay. um, and are our fastest athletes. Uh, but there is some gray area in there. There are some guys that are not the strongest in a way, mm-hmm. but they're extremely explosive. So we also have to keep that in mind, but okay. it is very important to include strength training, traditional strength training with your speed and explosive training. And this is probably an obvious question, but I, I was just curious. I mean, does flexibility play a role in speed? Yes, flexibility, mobility uh, do have a do have a role in in speed development. Um, and we're seeing more and more younger athletes who are not as flexible as they used to be. You know, I think when you and I were growing up, we were more active, more on our mm-hmm. feet, more involved in sports and, 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 uh, young athletes today tend to be more sedentary and we're seeing uh, a lot more, uh, flexibility needs, you know, okay. in the hips and the quads, but you can spend anywhere from three to five minutes each day on, uh, focusing solely on flexibility and mobility, performing those uh, exercises in your warm up, um, okay. and that should help. And that should help. But, but mostly uh, from a hip side, uh, hip strengthening is very important. Uh, hip flexor strengthening, having those athletes p- be able to generate uh, generate that knee up and to generate that force into the ground will ha- okay. will help with speed. So, and that's another little simple drill, simple exercise that you can plug right into your warm up or into your prep work. Uh, in the weight room before these guys come in to do their uh, strength training. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it's all, you know, especially the stretching piece, I know is super important, especially as we get older or we're more sedentary. And, and as I think you just mentioned, I mean, that's something you can do at home for two or three minutes a day, uh, especially for some of those young athletes, you know, that they're going to school most of the day. I mean, just taking three to five minutes during the day, maybe a couple times throughout the day and just, and just really getting your body stretched out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't take much. You know, you don't need to sit there for 10, 20, 30 minutes of just stretching, but you know, some form of some form of flexibility and mobility uh, daily, um, whether that's, you know, with team stretch or uh, coming in before you guys take the field, uh, foam rolling, stretching, performance and mobility. And then right after that, uh, some activation, either skipping low level plyometrics, build up sprints, and then uh, go into your workout or go into your game. I know massage therapy has gotten more popular in professional sports. Is getting a massage, I mean, c- can that help maybe loosen up some of the muscles? I mean, does getting a massage, I mean, obviously not every day. I know it's not good to have a massage every day, even though we would like to. But is that something that could play a role in, in helping somebody increase their speed? Yeah, so soft tissue work like massage, foam rolling to a degree. Uh, that will okay. break up some adhesions or some okay. uh, matted down tissue around your joints. Okay. Um, so if you can do that, then the uh, then the idea is your joints uh, should be able to move uh, more freely and easily while running. But but like you said, everything in moderation. You know, spending an hour on a massage table and then trying to go out and play a game is mm-hmm. probably not the best idea. I mean, if you think about you know, how do you feel after massage? You probably feel like just relaxing and <laughs> not doing anything, not playing yeah. in a high level, you know, situation, but, uh, you know, maybe one to two minutes of, uh, some, some tissue work, moving the tissue around, moving the fluid mm. around can to a degree, uh, help to produce that. But, you know, it comes down to the, to the d- traditional strength training, lifting heavy weights, lifting light weights, fast performing plyometrics and sprinting. Okay. Uh, you know, people want to get fast, but it's, but you have to get out there and you have to open yourself up. You have to expose yourself to high speed sprints. And and that's the most important. So let's, let's take all of the knowledge that you've accumulated throughout your career. And obviously you've made it to the pinnacle of your career. I mean, you're working with professional athletes with the Tampa Bay Rays 
And let's now let's take somebody that is just a young high school, just raw kid. And, you know, they come to you and obviously they're not the fastest person on their team. They say, Joey, what can I do to get faster? So what would be the first thing you would do to just what? I mean, would you want to watch them run? Like, how would you assess them? And when you're assessing them, what would you be looking for? Yeah, so if it's, a, if it's a young athlete that hasn't had many years of, of speed training, you want to get a baseline a baseline test, baseline measurement, and they may not have the access to the technology that mm-hmm. we have. So there, therefore, a simple stopwatch would work. Get a baseline sprint on this athlete, 40, 50, 60-yard sprint. Find out where they are. Watch them run. Watch them move. Okay. And then from there, start with the coordination drills. Your marching, your A marches, your okay. skipping drills, both forward and lateral, and then uh, you know uh, different switches, thigh switches or knee switches. All those drills will help build rhythm coordination, uh, and those are the foundations to speed development. From there, perform build up sprints. Build up sprint is where you would set a cone at say, uh, you know, zero yard and set another one at 30 or 40 yards, Mm -hmm. have the athlete run each step along the way. They just get a little faster and a little faster all the way through the cone, have them walk back, walk back, repeat that five, six, eight, 10 times, um, and get used to that and do that for, for a little while. Uh, from there you can, you can start, uh, incorporating some acceleration drills where the athlete would just lay belly down, face down. They would, you would just say, go, they would have to react, come up and accelerate 10, 20 yards, do that for a period of time. That's going to help that first step quick, quickness, that acceleration. Uh, now, you know, we're talking, this is about eight weeks in or, um, you know, two months into this, then you can start adding in resisted running in the forms of, uh, sled sprints in the forms of a parachute or in a form of, uh, okay. of a slight incline on a hill. And then from there, that's where you're going to spend probably the bulk of your work. You know, that first 20, 30 yards accelerate mm-hmm. now, uh, in sprint development. And then from there, you want to expose these players to high speed sprints where the athlete would jog or build up for 20 to 30 yards and then sprint max mm-hmm. effort for 20 to 30 yards. Those are called flying sprints. You know, and you got to we got to remember too. Team sport is not always straight ahead, so you need to uh, include right. curve sprints or curve running, uh, and that would be a good time to do that as well. You know, have the athlete start in a stationary position, and then just accelerate out at a curved sprint for twenty to thirty yards, um, and do that. But and you know, you can pick and choose over the course of a year. But if an athlete's starting out, you want to expose them to the build-up sprints first and uh, and the yeah. marching, the skipping, the high knees, all that to develop that rhythm and coordination. So it's definitely not something that's going to happen overnight. And, and, and as you know, we live in a world of instant gratification. That's what we want. Um, so it's not something where, you know, people that are listening, you know, you're not going to start doing some of this stuff Joey's talking about and start noticing that your speeds get increased with, you know, just three or four days of some of this training. I mean, you went, you just went through almost a two, two and a half month uh, workout plan. And, and I guess it would be, you know, you would start slowly. I would guess Joey seeing improvements. Uh, but, you know, after about two months, you should, you should start seeing that you're, you're faster than you were when you started. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is no, you know, overnight, uh, you know, change, you know, some athletes are going to develop a little quicker. So I'm going to take mm-hmm. a little bit longer. Everybody's journey is different, but yes, you have to look at the long-term picture. You, you got to take a step back and be like, okay, you know, I'm going to implement, you know, speed explosion training with my team, with my athletes. You know, you're talking, you know, you're looking at like 12 months. You're looking at like a year, like, okay, wow, okay. you know, you want to do this the right way. You want to do this injury free. You know, it takes time to develop. And over the course of an athlete's career, if you're starting early, you know, it gets a little bit easier uh, to where you get to this level, you know, guys would, can just do those marching, those skips real quick in their mm-hmm. warm up takes probably like a minute. Um, and then they can focus on some acceleration, some, some uh, resisted running right away. And then they're off, you know, we get 15 uh, total minutes with these guys to warm them up in spring training, to expose them mm-hmm. to some resisted running. And then they're on their way. They're going to play yeah. catch. They got ground balls. They got hitting. Um, 
but at the youth level, um, you really need to take your time, mm-hmm. you know, slow, slow cook them, so to speak. Yep. Uh, and, and look at the big picture, look at the, the year, look at their, their four years in high school, look at their college years, um, and go from there. But yeah, it's, and, it's and a it, process. And if anybody ever goes to a baseball game and you can get there early enough, you know, typically it would be the visiting team, but you can see these guys going through some of these drills, right before batting practice. But even if you can't get there that early and Joey, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I've been there when, uh, you know, you guys are getting ready to take the field before the national anthem. And these guys are running through some of those drills and doing sprints to get warmed up right before the game. Yes. Yeah. Right before the game, you'll see them down the line. They'll be doing some high knee runs, nice and quick. Uh, they'll be doing some skips, some straight leg runs to get mm-hmm. their hamstrings ready. Um, so yeah. And you'll, in and, and it, and it's roughly about a minute. Mm-hmm. A little more two minutes and you'll see them doing some of these acceleration drills so that way you know their first at bat they hit a ball you know deep shortstop you know in the hole then they're trying to beat out that to beat mm-hmm. out that throw um they've already exposed themselves to those they expose those muscles to those acceleration mm-hmm. uh and those in those high intensity sprints prior to the game and and that's one thing that i see at the youth level that doesn't really happen mm-hmm. um which need some attention to uh to really prepare these kids to actual play in a game they need Mm -hmm. to get down the line they need to perform some of these running drills some of these sprint work Mm -hmm. and and then and then go right into the ball game yeah it's it's certainly all about education and and i do want to tie this back joey to kind of what we do on a day-to-day basis and that's you know educating people about appearance and performance enhancing substances and and i know when it comes to strength and speed and and performance and all of those things uh you know people get tempted to use performance enhancing drugs to help achieve these physical goals and uh you know we we know there's athletes from all sports that that have done this you know we know there are people that are using these types of drugs that um, have no desire to compete, but for anyone listening that could be tempted to use performance enhancing drugs to help them get faster specifically, um, you know, what would be your message to them? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, and as you go up with the levels, you know, competition gets more and more Mm -hmm. intense and it gets harder and harder and harder, like you said, and, you know, athletes want that edge. And I remember, a few years back, um, there was a, a study that came out. They asked, you know, Olympic athletes, like, listen, hey, you know, if you took this pill and, and you were guaranteed a gold medal but died the next day, would you do it? And most of them said yes, uh, which really opened my eyes up. It's, uh, you know, it's very competitive, you know, as you go up through the levels. But but listen, like, it's, uh, you know, your life is very important. And it's it's a very dangerous world with PEDs. You don't know what you're taking. Uh, you don't know where it's coming from, who's making it. You really just have to focus on training, getting your proper rest, taking care of your nutrition, hydration before reaching for any supplements, before reaching for anything uh, right. along those lines. And as far as PEDs, in, in sports or just in, in regular, uh, general fitness, your life's too important and do not, do not go down that road. Do not consider any performance enhancing drugs. That's, I mean, that's a great message. And Joe, you would, uh, you know, mention that survey that was done by the Olympians. And, uh, in fact, I was just delivering a program to, uh, about 1400, uh, elite high school athletes, uh, last week in Florida. And I brought up that survey and, you know, as, as somebody that is not competitive or maybe you don't compete in sports, you know, you really don't know what those pressures are, but when you see a survey like that, and I believe it, you, you, I think it was more than half, um, that said, yes, you know, if they could yes. win a gold medal mm-hmm. and take this pill and they would die. And the answer is yes. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're obviously in a different mindset. And a lot of people don't understand that until until you're at that level. But um, I mean, it, it couldn't have been said any better. And, and you guys are listening to it from, you know, a guy that's that that trains professional athletes every day. So it's great advice. And obviously, I know that's an advice that that you talk with your players about. So the final question I have is just if you could leave one tip, just something you've learned throughout your career to, to people that are listening, what would be that one tip that's really impacted you that, that you could leave for somebody else to learn from? 
Um, just remember that everybody's journey is different. Um, and, and you can't compare yourself to other people. Uh, you know, focus on what you can control and, and embrace the boredom of consistency because that's what it really comes down to is to be able to do things consistently over time, purposeful hard work over time is going to set you set, set yourself up uh, for success uh, and, and just get focused and, and just focus on getting better uh, each and every day. But uh, try not to compare yourself to other people mm. um, and just embrace the boredom of consistency. And that and that's what I see that some of the the elite uh, athletes that I work with each and every day, they just embrace the boredom of consistency. This is what I do. This is how I go about my business every single day. Just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I mean, that 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 advice also translates right over into to every uh, you know, everyday activities and no matter what it is that you do in life. Now, Joey, before I let you go, I, I know you guys are busy, but out of this six part series, it's been really interesting. We've talked to guys at the major league level like you and guys at the minor league level. So we're asking you both two questions and you're going to have to tune into all the episodes to hear what your peers had to say. So the first question is, out of all of the baseball stadiums that you've had a chance to visit, which one is your favorite? I know you've gotten this question a lot, so it might come to mind and you might have a few, but but which which is your favorite? Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. There's so many, so many great par- ballparks, so much, so much history involved in these ballparks. Um, I would have to I would have to pick one from from the American League East. Uh, you know, I really enjoy Tropicana Field. Some of the newer stadiums are nice. Yeah, you know, I'm from New York. Yankee Stadium's, uh, you know, a good place to always to always come back to. Fenway Park's a lot of history. So I'd pick uh, I'd pick Yankee Stadium. Okay, yeah, I mean, super super nice. Um, you know, people have asked me that because I've I've been to all of the standing parks right now except for Atlanta's new stadium, and it's hard when you talk Fenway and Wrigley compared to let's say Yankee Stadium or where the Rangers are playing, just because they're so new, they're so modern. Uh, but two totally different experiences. All right, so here's my last question for you. This has been a really interesting one. If you were starting your own home gym and you could only purchase one piece of equipment to use, what would be that piece of equipment that you would have to have? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a tough one too. Um, I would I would probably, I mean, you can do a lot of things with yes, yeah, a barbell and some plates or a heavy kettlebell. You know, you don't really need a ton of equipment, but I would say something along the lines that has just a little bit of weight to where you can do strength training with that. So maybe just a barbell and some plates and I could be I could be happy for a while. That's that's really cool because a lot of you guys have had very, very similar, you know, obviously doing what you guys do and the expertise you have in the strength and conditioning world have uh, recommended the same, if not very, very similar piece of equipment. Well, Joey, thank you so much for taking your time out to be part of this PBS CCS series on the All Me podcast. We just appreciate you sharing your knowledge and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this for us. John, thank you for having me and uh, keep up the great work. I appreciate everything that you're doing for the uh, for the sports and for athletics and, and the general uh, fitness uh, industry. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.